right? Do you have should something we, else? Should we get into this? You know, I, I think we can. Have you guys ready for the message today? <laughs> you guys are about Pastor to Sheriff enter into out another bit, dimension. Chomping. And I'm trying to remember what Pastor Howie said. He was trying to tell me the intro to the Twilight Zone, and I can't remember it because I've never seen it. But um, one of the things that has been um, on my mind, um, I woke up one night and in the middle of the night, you know, as I tend to do, which some of you guys also join me in waking up in the middle of the night for no reason. And, How many um, of you guys wake up regularly in the middle of the night? Yeah. Look at that. That's like three oh, quarters almost. of your congregation. <laughs> Right. We should start a group or something. We should just start a prayer meeting right at like 3 in the morning. It's like 3 a.m. I'm know. up. What do you guys want to pray about tonight? <laughs> so anyways, the, the, the word twilight just kind of came to me. And I, and I was thinking like, oh, you know, like what about the twilight? And, uh, and so then a couple days later, I was watching um, a video on the Arctic. And they were talking about the twilight zone. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. That's, that's twice in one week. Um, and then... I was driving my car, and as I'm driving, I have my sunglasses on because I have blue eyes and I have a hard time seeing when the sun is bright, and I'm driving into the sun, and then I turn the corner, and as I turn the corner, it was almost like it was dark, and I couldn't see anything, and so I had to take off my glasses, and all of a sudden, I thought about it, is that I was in the twilight zone. <laughs> the Twilight Zone, which we'll, we'll get into, but you guys know, in the 1950s, there was a TV show, The Twilight Zone, and... Um, I, like I said, I never saw it, but anyways, I was really excited after this car ride, and I uh, got home, and, uh, and we're all sitting down, and I start talking about, like, I want to do a message on the Twilight Zone, because I don't know about, you know, you or not, but I like to make messages of everything. My kids love that, so no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, whatever comes up, there's a message that comes from it. So, so I'm sitting there, and, and I walk in the door, and I'm like, you know, this, I want to do a message on the Twilight Zone. And it was just dead silent. And, and they're like, like, like the TV show, The Twilight Zone? I'm like, no, not the TV show, like The Twilight Zone. And, uh, and so, you know, they started talking about the, the TV show and how it, made, it was kind of eerie, and it made somebody, some that, you know, like kind of fear and stuff like that. And, uh, and I thought... No, that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about there's a, there's a very specific thing about the Twilight Zone. And, I, and so I decided, I'm like, I'm going to study this out. And so I did a study on the Twilight Zone in the Bible. How many know that the Twilight Zone is actually in the Bible? And actually, one of those things, Melanie had said a couple, maybe a month ago or so, she was talking about how when something's pointed out to you, all of a sudden it just keeps coming up. And so after that, that time I had said, you know, I want to do this message on the Twilight Zone, and then all of a sudden I get these text messages from Sarah. Did you know that Twilight is here in the Bible? And Twilight's here in the Bible? And here's another passage with Twilight, and here's another passage with Twilight. And then we began to spark on this, and anyway, so I sat down, I put a message together, and so let me tell you that this is part of our Trust in the Lord series. We are going to talk on the Twilight Zone. Amen. Are you ready? You know, I think sometimes, you know, being married to Pastor Sherry is like living in the Twilight Zone. <laughs> And uh, I could probably put together a string of a bunch of messages about, you know, the Twilight Zone. Uh, this one here particularly, uh, we, it is part of our Trust in the Lord series, but we are going to actually probably break it out into two parts. So we will have uh, today's message, and then I think next month we'll probably pick up again in, in another one. But why don't we get started today even in, in the book of Genesis, right in the very beginning. You guys good with that? In Genesis chapter 1, verse number 5. It says, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called light, or sorry, night. And so the evening and the morning were the first day. And then I want to jump down, and we're going to read a little bit further in Genesis 1, uh, 14 to 18. And it says, then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days, and for years, and let them be for great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. And, and then he made the stars also, and God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, and to rule over the day, and over the night, and divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So right from the very beginning, we see, you know, what did God do? created these two, two lights. What, did he, what do we call them? The sun 
and the moon. And so the sun rules the day, the moon rules the nighttime, and uh, these here lights, they, they, they actually, they overlap, and that's part of what happens. They overlap in the evening time and in the morning time, and we call that, right, you know, there's the dusk, and the dawn that takes place. When you actually look at that word in the evening, in, in, the, in the original context, it actually just says that it's, it means dusk or sunset. And so this is a really kind of a unique experience that's going on right here in the very beginning, right, where there, it brings out the purpose of these lights, right? And it says not only to give, to give light and, and shine, right, but also it says for times and for seasons and for, you know, various other elements, right, are all tied into the purpose of why God created the sun and the moon to be able to rule the day into the night. And so we want to, today, we're going to be focusing more, obviously, on the twilight element of this rather than uh, kind of what takes place in the morning hours. So what is, what is twilight officially? So I actually, you know, of course, Sherry wanted to start off in, you know, Webster's, you know, 1828 dictionary. That's her favorite dictionary. And it says there, it says that it is a faint light which is reflected upon the earth after sunset and before sunrise. It's actually a dim light. That's one of the definitions that it comes out with. It says it is a dubious or an uncertain view, right? So someone might, might say it's like as the twilight or the probability, right? Uh, another one is obscure, imperfectly illuminated or shaded. This is another terminology that we use with the twilight. Merriam Webster's adds this part to the definition, which says the intermediate state that is not clearly defined or even a period of decline. So this is a whole lot of different uh, information that is coming out that really breaks down more about what is happening at twilight. Collins Dictionary actually says one more thing. It says any indefinite, or sorry, in, indefinite or transitional condition or area. And really what you're seeing at this particular time of, of, of twilight is, is that the sun is obviously going down, right? And then you see the horizon that takes place and, and there's all these different degrees that actually occurs. And, and six degree increments is really what is progressing through this particular part. Did you guys know that there's actually stages to the twilight? For those who didn't, you just learned something new. There's actually stages to the twilight. And do you know what the era, there's, there's actually a lead up to the twilight, and that particular uh, lead up into the twilight is actually called the golden hour. We have a lot of golden, you know, hours that are floating around uh, right now. But that hour right before, you know why? Because it gives off, what happens? It gives off long shadows, and it gives off this warmth in the evening, this warm feeling, all that, they call that. And it's great for taking pictures, by the way. Okay? I thought you were going to say it's great for taking naps by taking in the window, naps. like a cat. <laughs> yeah, so they call that the golden hour. And then it leads into the next part, which is the beginning of twilight, which is called civil. Say civil. Civil. Civil twilight. And in that particular moment, what happens is the sun now disappears, okay? It starts to disappear, and, and certain stars start to become illuminated above us, okay? There's, a, there's, a, there's something that takes place. It starts shifting there, and that is actually called the blue hour. So we went from the golden hour to the blue hour. It sounds like we're talking about hair colors, you know, the golden and blue, blue aged hairs, right? So and anyways, so this is, a, that's the first stage that takes place, and that's actually from zero degrees to 60 degrees, and then you have the next phase that takes place of, of, the, of the twilight, and that is called nautical, so say nautical. You guys familiar with that term nautical? That starts at six degrees below the horizon line between the sea and the sky. And what happens at that particular, at this particular point is that the horizon is no longer visible. Okay, this is where we get this, this terminology that the sailors use as the nautical hour or nautical dusk, okay? This is part of what happens because now as you are going, the sun has now decreased over the horizon to such a point that no longer can you distinguish where the horizon is. Does this make sense? Then the last part of this comes, um, and then ba yeah, at that point, by the way, they're no longer able to navigate by the horizon line, and that leads us into the last part of the twilight, so the third, third part, which is astronomical, and that starts at 12 degrees 
below the horizon. And at that point, it says that even the faint stars that are out there now start to become illuminated because the sun has now went down for far enough below the horizon at that 12 degree mark. Everyone make sense on all that? So that is really what is happening when we start understanding what twilight is. So there's all of this process that's taking place with civil, nautical, and astronomical uh, parts that are all part of that, that, that sun that changes over the horizon. And that there gives us what we know as twilight. 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 I'm going to say this forever. So today we want to take you into the Bible, into a, um, a story that we've talked a lot about actually, and a man that we've talked about, David. How many have heard of our man David here before? Yes, David. He was a good man, but how many know he had walked through some hard times in his life? And so there was a scenario in 1 Samuel chapter 29 where um, David was like, you know, he was a warrior. He was a fighter, and he was a good one. And so, you know, people wanted David on their team because David won. He, he was amazing. He was a great warrior. And so there's a scenario where he's ready to bring his men into battle, and he's on his way. And then in 1 Samuel 29, verses 8 and 9, we hear what his, his leader says to him. It says, so David says to Achish, but what have I done? See, what happens is Achish is his leader, and he says, you know what? I know I just want you to sit this one out. Just sit back here. And so David's saying to him, but, but what have I done? And to this day, what have you found in your servant as long as I've been with you that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my lord, the king? He's saying, like, I want to be with you in this. And Achish answered and said to David, I know that you are as good in my sight as an angel of, as an angel of God. Nevertheless, the princes of the Philistines have said, he shall not go up with us to the battle. And so we're going to get back to this in just a minute, but... Um, I want to talk a little bit about what happened after this point. So David, you know, here he's, he's experiencing this rejection from, you know, going into battle. He's all prepared, ready. He has his men. And then he's, you know, been rejected and he's turned away. And he goes on and he goes back home. And how many know this, the, what happened when they got back home? Do you guys remember? They found, it was not good, that's right. They found out that the Amalekites had come and ransacked their home. And so this is in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 1 to 8. Basically, they come back, and, uh, and they come back home. They're devastated. They're, you know, distraught. And uh, he doesn't understand why his leader doesn't want him to fight. And he comes up, and he finds that their whole home has been ransacked, ransacked, set on fire, and all the women and children taken. Now, they didn't kill anybody, but they took everybody captive. And so here, you know, David is feeling this, like, great distress on him. And it says... In verse 6, 1 Samuel 30, verse 6, it says, Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and daughters. Now, I don't know about you. We've talked about this a little bit before. But if you're depressed and you're feeling pretty low, and then you're going back home hoping to, you know, find the comfort of being in, at home, and you get back home and then you see that your home has been ransacked and what, what you know is comfort and the safe place has been taken from you, then you're feeling pretty low. How many would feel pretty low at that point? Well, all of a sudden, David's men turn on him, and it says that they want to stone him. And so, you know, here what we want to talk about, even in terms of the, this twilight message, is some things that actually took place in this instance. So the first thing is that there are difficult times. You're going to go through hits in life. David here, he spent, you know, years on the run from Saul, and now he's like in this place where he's experienced this major rejection. He's just really, um, you know, he, he was in a low place. And uh, this isn't just talking about him, them rejecting him, you know, just on a surface level. This is like his character, you know, who he was, everything that he stood for, everything that he was inside. How many have ever felt like that before, where you felt like you're just walking through a blow where it's just like it, it hits you right where you feel it? It hits you right where it's the core of who you are, and, and it's hard to get through. This is a blow that happens, and... You know, here, not only the nation that, the, the people that he's leading, but his leader was against him in this moment. And this is very discouraging and very frustrating if you were to go through this. I'm sure David was at that place. You know, and here, it's not an easy time. And so these are things that we actually walk through 
in life. David's not alone in this. You're not alone in this. These are things that we all walk through. So then you got their come home, as, as, as Pastor Sherry said. So they could return to Ziglag, right? So they, they went, they were supposed to go out to battle with the lords of the Philistines, actually, at that moment. And then they said, nope, that's not going to happen. This is the David who says that they killed tens of thousands of us. And so they said, nope. So he returns home. He's in this place of distraught. And the first blow came where they were already depressed. They're already in this state of rejection. And then they find out that all of their, everything that they have has disappeared. So all of, their, all of their goods, all of their households have been burned down with fire. The, the remaining of the, everything was actually taken out at that particular time. They lost their families. They lost their loved ones. What would you, what would you do? That's blow number two, right? And that's a big blow. And that's a big hit that took place to this individual and all of the people who were with him at that particular time. As you're leading the individuals, don't forget that as the leader, you know, what they're feeling, what they're experiencing, you're also going through at the same time, but they're also looking at you because you're the leader. And that's what David was really feeling, the pressure of that. Now, what would we do if you think about that? You know, if you were out, you know, you were away, you were at a job, you were working, or you came home, and everything that you had all of a sudden had disappeared. It would be one thing that, you know, you just lost, you know, for instance, your finances. Okay? It would be another thing maybe if, you know, a, a loved one died. Okay, it may be another thing that happens, you know, where, you know, your car broke down. And, and all of those are just kind of, you know, little things. But, but think about the circumstances that are really going on here. Their house and their city in this entirety, everything that they know, everything that they worked for, all the years that they spent building that, all burned down. Every man's family was now taken captive. Think about what you would be going through if everyone that you loved was now taken into captivity by another country, another foreigners, those who didn't necessarily treat you know, them with great dignity and respect. And so this is a place where it says, it says that they wept until they had no more power to weep. Does that sound about right? Weeping till you have no more power left in you to be able to weep because that is how deeply hurt and wounded you are at this particular time. So you got this second blow, the second hit that comes from the enemy that David is experiencing. And here's the thing. Then it says that he was greatly distressed. You know what that means? It means he was in trouble. He was in pain, right? He was in danger. Have you ever been, you know, you know, in that state where you just feel, you know, you're just in pain? You just feel endangered? You, you feel like everything's kind of just fallen uh, against you right now? And here's the thing that I learned all through these processes is that, you know, you would think that sometimes that when the enemy comes and attacks you and he gives you a big blow, he gives you a big hit, that that would be enough. You know, it's like that knockout blow where you're like lying flat on your back and you're just sitting there, I don't have anything more. I've just wept until I can't weep anymore. I'm completely exhausted. I got nothing left. And then you know what happens? The devil comes and he, and he throws another blow and another hit your way. He, he, he's not content with just giving you the knockout blow. He wants to give you another follow-up to that knockout blow to really take you out. You guys know what I'm talking about? He doesn't just give you one hit. He gives you two hits and three hits and four hits. And David here is getting hit now a third time, and he's in this great place of distress. And the devil, it says, his purpose. Why does he do this? It says that the devil comes but yet to kill, to steal, and to destroy he is out for your destruction. Look at the one next to you. I want you to really catch this. The devil is out for your destruction. He's out for my destruction because he's here to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And so what the first thing that you have to really realize here is this blow comes, this hit comes, his men turned on him. That's what's happening. Now, it's not just I lost my family, I lost my city, I lost all of my livestock. I've now, my close intimate friends have now turned on me as well and they are so grieving and so hurting that now they wanna kill me too. Every element, every facet of his life is come here under attack. 
And I want you to know one thing about twilight as it approaches. It, it, it begins in the fact that the light appears to be fading over the horizon. Okay, that's what it appears to be. It actually says in one of the definitions that I gave you that it would be in a state of decline. That is one of the, the definitions that it says. But I want you to realize something here to know is that the source of the light is not actually changing. The source of the light, the sun itself, is not changing any of its brightness. It is our perspective, it's our vision, it's what we see over the line of the horizon or something that is blocking it that is changing what we think of, what we view of, what we're thinking of, once again, about that light. But the light itself has not changed, nor has it altered. And so even in these difficulties, right, we need to think about what is it revealing to us in that case. What does it reveal inside of us? Yeah. There was a moment that when we went to Guatemala and um, you know how many live in Windsor, Ontario here where the winter time is kind of gray almost every day. <laughs> and, and there are days, uh, lots of days between the times when you see the sun in the winter time, right? And, uh, and so anyways, I hadn't realized, I was really enjoying winter, I was loving, you know, having cold weather and just uh, really the, the threat of snow, like I was all about that right before we left. And as we were, um, w as we got on the airplane and then we started going up and I didn't realize that it felt so gray and gloomy until all of a sudden we got past the clouds and the sun just all of a sudden just overtook me and it was like this warmth just came over my body and in that moment I thought there are so many people that don't even realize that they're walking through these gloomy times where they've been hit time and time again where things have been coming after them and all they feel is that gray and that gloomy and they're they're getting by they're getting by but they're not even realizing that they're not living up to their full potential because it, it's just it is what it is and this is how life has always been but all of a sudden coming across those clouds and peer through that and the light begins to shine and you begin to allow God's presence to just fill inside of your heart and let me tell you the warmth that will come over your soul as this happens will change your life and so in this moment when David has been hit time after time after time again what is his response I love this because I feel like, you know, there's certain stories in the Bible that, that I feel like I can really relate to. I don't know if you guys feel like that too, but, but David is kind of one of those, you know, where some, even in this, you know, feeling like the people closest to you are, you know, turning against you and you're just feeling like, you know, God, what do I do? You know what David's response was? We can read it in verse six. It's the end of verse six. It says, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. David was in a difficult place. He was not walking through life with all these like rainbows and roses. He was prepared for war and then he was rejected. And then like his leaders rejecting him. And then he goes back and he finds out that his safe place, his home is all taken from him. And then as he's trying to grieve that, he finds that the people who are closest to him, who should be there all supporting each other, end up turning on each other. And you know, sometimes that's the way that things happen in families. You know, the enemy's been after um, families lately. Hardcore. Let me tell you is that he has been relentless in this. And what happens is when he is coming after the family, what he's doing is he's, um, everybody's feeling the attack in the family. So something happens that affects the entirety of the family. And then instead of the family coming together and rallying together and being this strong support for one another, what happens is that they start turning on each other. And then division starts to come in. And this is where the enemy's really been trying to get into the place to create a, a, a divide within the family because he needs to break up the family in order to stop the move of God. But he can't win. Do you know why? Because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Our God is greater. There is no one that is, that is stronger. The enemy is not even on an equal opposite playing field than God. He is below him. He is subject to Jesus. He is subject to God. 
And in this moment, we know, and we need to know the power that we have as children of the Most High God, that we have power to tread over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. You might walk through the fires, you might walk in, 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 in the waters and feel like you're about to drown, but you know when I look up, my salvation draws nigh because God is on my side. I cannot fail. He is with me. What can mere mortals do to me? And in this moment, we need to understand that we have to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. When we feel like we're, we're, we're pressed down and we feel like we're walking after hit after hit after hit, and then the last thing that we want to do is try to bring ourselves up. But the way that we can do it is turning to God. And see, you know, a lot of times we want to turn to people or we want to turn to a friend, you know, and, and our friends, you know, they, they can encourage us. But we also seen in the Bible that there's scenarios where friends don't necessarily encourage you the way that you need to be encouraged. There are times in my life, let you me tell you, where I need a kick in the butt. There are times where I'm walking down a road and, I, and I'm sinking further and further into what it, whatever it is that, that I'm going through. And if I didn't have the people who were bold enough to come and pull me out of that and say, enough is enough, stop acting like this, you need to get your stuff together and you need to go to God and you need to start looking to him for the answer because he is the way, the truth, and the life, then I would just keep going all the way down. And we need people to be able to lift us up. But let me tell you, we have to be wise in the people that we go to. And ultimately, we need to first go to God. Every one of us has that innate need inside of us that we have to go to God. We need him with everything that's on the inside of us. God, I need you. God, I can't do life without you. God, you need to show me exactly where I need to be in this moment. You are Jehovah Ori, the Lord, my light. You are the light that lights the pathway before me. I don't want to walk in the darkness. I don't want to fall down this hole anymore. I don't want to trip. I don't want to, I don't want to be lost by the wayside. God, I need you. I know that you are faithful mm -hmm. in my life. And this is everything that we need to do is we need to remind ourselves, Sherry, God is faithful. God is true. He's true to his word. He is, he is all loving. He, everything that you need, he's got for you right here because he's Jehovah Jireh. Mm -hmm. So when Pastor Sherry read this verse, it says, but David and strengthened himself in the Lord his God. He went, to, he went to God first. The following verse actually says, then David said to Abathar, the priest, Amalek's son, bring, please bring the ephod here to me. And Abathar brought the ephod to David and he inquired of the Lord. See, the thing that she's bringing out here is, is that it's great to go to companions, it's great to go to the priest, it's great to go to the pastor, but the first thing, place you need to go to is God. Go to God first. Go to the Go to the man of God next, or your spouse next, or your, wherever your consultant may be to help confirm that which the Lord is speaking to you. But you need to turn to God first and not omit going to God and just go to every other counsel that is out there. We miss it when we do that. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added. We need to go seek God. Now, I want to bring out this here. So it says... There comes a point right in the twilight as it's transitioning from civic into nautical. And when it hits into the nautical, it says that you can no longer see the horizon. So the sailors and those who are using the horizon as a point to be able to follow, to be able to be led by, to be able to walk out and to navigate, you know what happens? It changes. It's gone. I can no longer navigate by the same way that I was currently navigating. That's what happens at nautical dusk. The horizon is no longer available for me to be able to see, to navigate. And you know what happens in that moment? It says that you now switch over to the astronomical view. And when you switch up to the astronomical view, you now need to navigate in accordance to the stars. So this is what's happening. There's a shift that takes place, and it takes place in just one moment of time. See, we need to be going the natural way that we're doing things isn't, isn't going to work. Your intellect isn't just going to be able to work when you're hitting through the twilight. You can't see where you're going. You don't know what to do. You guys ever been there? How many are there right now? You're like, I don't know what to do. Okay, and so God then, we need to go to God. It says that in his word, it says, thy word 
is a light unto my path and a lamp unto my feet. You know why it says it in two different ways in that particular passage? Because you need to be able to see where you're going, but you also need to be able to have it revealed to you and illuminated the path where you are walking. And it says that God's word is that lamp unto my feet and the light to my pathway so that I can see where I'm going and also where I'm walking. And we learned last week, we talked even more about God's word and that God himself, Jesus, is the word and he is there with us as we are walking through. And so the first thing that we need to realize that when we go and we seek God is we need to go seek his word and what does it have to say about my life? What does it have to say about my circumstances? What does God's word say about what's happening? And I realize that not every single thing in, in, in the Bible is gonna be applicable for your life as to whether you should buy a car or this house or whatever, but we always go first to God's word. And then it says we complement going to God's word for the other word of God, which is also through prayer, where we communicate with him. And it brings that out in 1 Thessalonians. And what does it say? Pray continually. Pray always. We should always be in a place where we are communicating with God. In Psalms 119, it says, Let your mercy come also to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your word. So, so shall I have an answer for him who reproaches me, for I trust in your word. All of these things go hand in hand together. God's word. Look at, look at your neighbor and say, God's word goes hand in hand with prayer. I want you guys to catch this point because I feel a lot of times people stumble on it. Sometimes we just go to prayer and we don't go to God's word. And sometimes people want to say what they hear in prayer violates God's word. God will never speak to you in communication something that will violate his word or his nature and character. Guys, catch that? I was just talking to Pastor Sherry this week. She was re talking about this story about some, some pastor who, who got into doing some illegal things and, and, and prosecuted and all these different things. And every step of the way, you know what he's saying? God told me to do it. I trust in God. God says, lead, I'm going you know, to lead you out, blah, blah, blah. He's going to get me out of this. But you're doing something that violates God's word. When we seek God's face, when we seek his direction, which we need to do, we need to also seek his word first. Yes. And his word will always line up with what he speaks to you in prayer. They will not violate one another. I think there's, a, there's an element here of congruency that is, is vital to our lives as Christians. Is that there's there's two parts here. There's congruency of what what's going on in the inside of your heart and what you project outside of your life. You know, being congruent and being in integrous behind closed doors and in the public eye. Right? There's a congruency in that. But then there's a congruency with exactly what Pastor Brian's talking about here. Is that the Word of God and prayer go hand in hand, and they don't contradict each other. E each other. So if you feel that when you're praying you're getting something and it's not lining up with God's Word. I wouldn't even take a second thought at what you feel that you've heard because it will line up with God's word. It will not go against God's word. And, um, and so one of the things I want to go on to talk about is in the twilight, there can be danger. How many know sometimes as the darkness is approaching, you can feel a little bit of, uh, of that, that evil and that danger that's coming on. There's evil in darkness, right? I remember being um, young and uh, just getting to the age where I was staying home by myself, just starting to babysit and stuff, and I was terrified of the dark. And, um, and so it would get to points where I'd be like, I'd be babysitting during the day, and I'd be like, okay, I got this. It's going to be great. I can, I can feel it. Everything's going to be fine. I can see everything. I know where everything is, and so I will be fine. And then as the twilight happened, I would just start to feel that fear that was just rising up inside of me. And, and so I would have to do whatever I could to be able to ignore the darkness, which was going and turning on all the lights in the house and making sure that I was completely illuminated in the space that I was in. And, um, and the thing is, is that we all know that things happen in the nighttime. 
right? How many know is that a lot of times when people are committing crimes or stuff, they're, they're waiting till the evening hours or to the nighttime because, and, and even when we refer to things, if they do it during the day, we're like, they did this in broad daylight as if it's like out of this world that they would even attempt something while it's daytime. Do you know what I mean? And so we see that there is evil that happens in the nighttime. Job 24, 13 to 17 says, There are those who rebel against the light. They do not know its ways nor abide in its paths. The murderer rises with the light. He kills the poor and needy, and in the night he is like a thief. The eye of the adulterer waits for the twilight, saying, No eye will see me. And he disguises his face. In the dark, they break into houses which they marked for themselves in the daytime. They do not know the light, for the morning is the same to them as the shadow of death. This is something that just like kind of hit me. The same to the morning is the same to them as the shadow of death. If someone recognizes them, they are in the terrors of the shadow of death. And then we can see even that there is temptation that happens in the midnight hour, in that twilight part. In Proverbs chapter 7, verses 6 to 12, it says, For at the window of my house I looked through my lattice, and I saw among the simple, I perceived among the youth, a young man devoid of understanding. He was passing along the streets near her corner, and he took the path to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And there a woman met him with the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart, she was loud and rebellious. Her feet would not stay at home. At times she was out t- outside, at times in the open square, lurking at every corner. See, temptation is going to come. Temptation is out there. But we have the scripture that says, God, lead me not into temptation. See, the, the prayer is not, God, remove everything. Let there not be temptation in my life. Because we know that, that that's just not it's not going to happen like that. There is temptation, and everybody's going to be tempted by things because that's what the enemy does. He tries to tempt you because he needs to try to trip you up. But we pray, God, lead me not into temptation. That must mean that there is a pathway that leads by temptation, but there's also a pathway that leads away from temptation. And so we need to be able to take the pathways that lead away from temptation and not just go into the twilight in the night season, in the dark hour, and go in the, in the places where we know that evil is, is lurking there. It, it says lurking at every corner. It, it's, there, there's a scripture, I think it's in Proverbs, speaking of Proverbs, they, they lie in wait for blood. You know, the, this is what the enemy is doing. He's trying to sneak in the shadows and just kind of blend into the darkness and wait for you to be unaware of where you're walking by to be able to grasp you. The Bible says, Matthew 6, 13, lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. And just as Pastor Brian was talking about, that prayer is that communication that helps us to be able to navigate through these times and to be able to go. Psalm 91, I love, Psalm 91 has been just on my heart, in my mind over and over and over and over again. I don't know, I feel like there's so much to it. I want I want to preach many messages all on Psalm 91, but it says in verses five to six, it says, you shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that lays lays waste at noonday. Psalm 34, four says, I sought the Lord. He heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. The darkness is not something to fear. The twilight, when things begin to happen and when things are lurking in the shadows, that is not something that children of God should have to fear. Because as I said before, we've got the power of God on the inside of us. We carry the light wherever we go, and the light is what illuminates the darkness. And so we don't have to be afraid of the terror by night. We don't have to be afraid of the arrow that flies by noonday. Because we know that God is still good. God is greater. Greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. There is nothing that my God cannot do. And that takes us to point number five, which says, take action. So here we have David, and it says, then David attacked them from twilight until evening of the next day. Not a man of them escaped, except for 400 young men who rode rode on camels and fled. So David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away, and David rescued his two wives, and nothing of theirs was lacking, either great or uh, small, sons or daughters, spoil or anything which had been taken from them. David recovered all. Say, he recovered all. 
Now, here's the thing. David went down to the Amalekites, but here's the thing, and it says that he attacked them from twilight to the following evening, basically from twilight to twilight. And the part that I want you guys to understand, which is really important here, is, is that David was prophesied, and it said by, to God, uh, sorry, from God, he said, what? You need to pursue them, and you will overtake them, and you will recover all. But it required David to actually take action. He had to hear and he had to activate his faith to be able to not just believe that when he pursued them that he would overtake, but he actually then had to take the next step of action to be able to put in motion a battle. This is the same thing that we, we learned even last week when we were talking about uh, speaking in tongues, right? We talked about how you can have the faith to believe that tongues is for you, but there's another level of faith to be able to take the action to be able to actually apply it to your life. This is what we need to do. We, when we go to God, he, we, we sought God in this particular case. We listened to God. God gave us direction, and then we need to be aware that the direction that he gives us, we got to actually do something about it and apply it. It to our lives. That's right. And so going on to the next point is astronomical twilight reveals things. So if we keep going on in, in this uh, account in the Bible of what happened, David and his men are going down and they find a servant of the enemy along the way. And they decide to see if he would lead them to the pathway to the enemy. And so the, um, the servant says, uh, so it says in 1 Samuel 30, chapter 30, verses 15, it says, and David said to him, can you bring me down to this company? And he said, this is the servant speaking, he says, swear unto me by God that you will neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring you down to this company. And so then we can see if we jump down to verses 22 to 24, it says, then all the wicked and worthless men of those who went with David answered and said, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except for every man's wife and children that they may lead them away and depart. But David said, my brothers, you shall not do so with what the Lord has given, who has preserved us and delivered us into the hand, into our hand, the troop that came against us. For who will heed you in this matter? But as his part is who goes down to the battle, so shall his part be who stays by the supplies and they shall share a light. The thing is, is that twilight reveals, in this moment, it reveals the hidden things. Now, the hidden things that it might be revealing are things that are in our heart. It might be things that are happening around, but the twilight will reveal. You know, as Pastor Brian was talking about that astronomical twilight, where all of a sudden, even the faintest of stars will appear. And so there are times where things will appear. And in this moment, you know, David, you know, David inquired of the Lord. He said, the Lord said, go, you're going to definitely win this battle. He goes, he finds a servant. The servant's going to take him as long as he offers protection for him. We see they go, they recover all, and then they come back. And it says that the wicked and worthless men who went, they didn't want the people who stayed back. See, what happened was there was people who were along for the journey. They got tired. See, they were all prepared for war. They came back hoping for some solace in their place of safety. They didn't find it. They came back to find that all the people were gone, all their loved ones were gone, their safe place was gone. They're feeling really down. They're feeling really discouraged. And then all of a sudden they find out, you know, they're, they're, they're you know, turning and want to kill David. And then they find out that we've got to now go down to battle and we've got to go recover all of this. Mm -hmm. So this is just like, you know, when you feel like you have nothing left inside, you've been hit once after another time, after another time, after another time, and you just just don't feel like you have the strength to continue on. This is where some of those men were feeling in this time. And so there was a few of them that they got to, to the brook and they said, we need to just wait here and just stay here. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of watch the supplies and you guys go on and recover all. And so there was a group of them that weren't able to make the whole journey to go and fight and to take back what was rightfully theirs. And so those who went with David, it actually says that they were wicked. There, there was wicked and worthless men that were part of that group. That, that when they won and they came back and they meet these people who were with the supplies, they didn't want to give them any of the, uh, any of the spoils. Because they're like, they didn't even come and do this with us. You know, and there's, we have to understand that along the way in our journey, there are going to be people who are with us the long haul. Sometimes the people who are with us in the long haul, 
shouldn't be with us in the long haul because they're not, they're wicked and they're worthless. <laughs> Just to put it plainly like the Bible does. But there are going to be people who are with us in the long haul who do actually, who are for us and who are for the cause and, and are good people. But then there are also going to be people who, you know, are growing weary and growing tired. And so they're only with us for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. We need to not judge the people along the way. We're with each other to the end, all the way to the end. Mm -hmm. and, and just because this person needed to stop and take a rest doesn't mean they don't get the spoils. Mm -hmm. Even though they took a rest, we're here for you. We cover you. We're taking care of it. And the other one was with the servant there is that he had compassion on that servant and the person who was his enemy now became his friend and, and somebody who was able to help and assist him in that particular journey. So it reveals many different things when you're going through and walking through that twilight zone. The, the other thing, real quick, and this is just a quick point on this, is that when you're in the twilight zone, you know what happens is there's all these different things that talk about how far you are away from different latitudes and as you go further away, um, that the twilight zone actually lasts for an extended or longer period of time. The, an average, you know, uh, twilight only takes a matter of a few moments or a few minutes. But in certain uh, places, those twilight zones can actually last not only a full day, but even matters of weeks. And so the really, the point that I just want to bring out about this is that there is a relevance that sometimes you may be going through a twilight zone and it may be a short season, maybe a long season. You don't know, but here's the thing. You don't always know how long the season is. When David came back to, to find out that all of his, all the relatives and everyone was taken, he didn't know how long that season was going to last. It only ended up lasting a very short season, but that could have lasted for a much, much, much longer point uh, in time. So we need to be aware that the twilight swifts around and changes. And here's the last point that I want to make, is that even though... You might walk through the dark in the night. Joy comes in the morning. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, on Thursday when we were practicing, and I had at the last minute switched out a song and I put in um, echoes. And as we were singing, I'm like, wait, 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 Linda, sing that, sing that part again. And then she says it. And I'm like, says, just hold on, for the dawn will soon arise. And the, and the Bible says in... Let me find my scripture here. It says, Psalm 30, verse 5. It says, His anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Let me tell you, in these seasons that we go through, like Pastor Brian's saying, some of them are going to be long. Some of them are going to be short. We don't know the extent and the time of, of how long things are going to happen for us. And David here, you know, David... In his life, he was anointed king. But after he was anointed king, he didn't immediately reign over all of Israel. There was a span of, what was it, 30 years? 13, 13 years be, from the time that he was anointed to the time that he actually reigned over all of Israel. And so here's the thing is that we need to not grow discouraged in where we're at in life. We need to not grow discouraged in what's going on because even though we're walking through a season, there's going to come a time where the morning is going to come and joy comes in the morning. See, we have to believe that we're not in this night season forever. We're, it's not going to be night forever. The joy, the morning, it comes. And that's for you and that's for me and that's for us as a body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And, that, and, that, and that's what's happening. Why don't we all stand right now as we wrap up this part of the message. See, David went through blow, blow after blow after blow, hit after hit after hit. He was going through. He was on the run from Saul for, for years and years and years. And then he goes through this extreme adversity right here at the very end. And then it happens right in those following verses. You know what happens? It, Saul also died, and he became the king of Judah. And so that breakthrough that she's speaking about that happens, it happens. But you had to be led by God. You had to be walking through God. It was dark. He had no idea that his whole life was about to change in a moment of time. And you have no awareness to what God is doing on the other side of the mountain that you cannot see. The light 
the perspective that we see in the midst of the twilight, it changes what we see, but the light source never changes. The light source of the sun is always there and always present. The light source of God Almighty, it never changes regardless of how faint or dim you may be seeing the light at this moment in time. It is always the brightest light that is shining. And the shifting that takes place always is taking place from the horizon of the natural unto the heavenlies where our focus and our view needs to be on things that are above. I want to just close out with this particular passage. We started it off today in prayer. In Psalms 37, it says, Do not fret of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and, and feed on his faithfulness. Is God faithful? He most certainly is. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. And then it says, commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light, and your justice as the noon day. When you're walking through the twilight, when you're walking from, when the light seems like it's fading, you're walking through the darkest times, when you can't see because the horizon is no longer there, you don't know where you're going or what you're to do, where do we go? We go to the source. We go to the light. We go to God Almighty, and we ask Him, and we seek His face in prayer. We seek His face in His word, and we say, lead me, guide me, be a light unto my path and a lamp unto my feet this day so that I can see where I am going, what I am about to do, and I'm believing right now that there's breakthrough that is happening because as you walk into, the, into that darkness, you also walk out more into the light. I want to pray. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for this day. God, I thank you that you are helping us to focus on the things of what you are doing and, and, and the light and the things to come, Father. I just pray even for every person who's walked through the darkness, Father, who's walked through that twilight hour where they almost feel like they can't move on, they can't keep going, they can't, they have to just set it down for a minute. God, right now, I thank you that the joy comes in the morning and your refreshing power is just pouring over every soul in this building right now in Jesus' name. God, I thank you that you are leading us beside the still water and that you are restoring our souls. I thank you that even though we might walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil because you are with us. God, I thank you that your rod and your staff, they are comforting to us because you are the great shepherd. And we thank you for who you are. I thank you that you go before us this week. And as every person walks through these doors today, God, I thank you that they would take their, uh, their purpose, Father, out into the mission field. And they would shine your love, shine your glory for all to see. God, we praise you today for who you are. In Jesus' name. Amen. The altars will be open today. If you need prayer, if you feel like you're in that dark season or you're walking through that twilight right now, you need prayer, the altars will be up here. We'll have people who will be here praying for you and helping you along the way. If you want information about salvation, if you want information about tongues or you need healing, come on up to the altar. Otherwise, you are dismissed. Have a blessed and a prosperous week. Amen. <laughs>